known that many patients uh many patients and uh, many people or many doctors in fact say that in iska colon thoda bada hai thoda mota hai and if that is the way it is then it can give rise to slow transit of food across the colon and can cause constipation so what do we eat today suppose i eat something now i will excrete it on an average day after tomorrow morning so the in healthy volunteers the mean colonic transit time is around 34 to 35 hours it can be as less as 18 hours so if i eat today evening now afternoon i can excrete it tomorrow morning if i have got a good transit or if i have a very slow transit i might excrete it after 3 days so the upper limit of a normal transit of food across the colon is 72 hours and if it goes beyond that then we say that the patient is definitively constipated so very important to know that the mean colonic transit time is around 34 to 35 hours so let us look at more physiology and pathology then so basically colonic muscles have four main functions the most important function is that they don't allow the bowel the, the food that comes across the ic wall into the cecum to be directly excreted so they slow it down they delay the passage of the luminal contents because it's around 1000 ml right that comes across the ic wall so what the colonic muscles do is that they delay the passage of these luminal contents to help time for absorption of water and that's how stool becomes harder as they pass across the colon the second function is that they mix the contents of the colon and allow as much as contact of this particular mixture that comes from the ileocecal wall into the cecum to get into contact with the mucosa for absorption of water the colon also stores feces so that's why we don't go to the washroom every i mean throughout the day is because the colon the function is to store the feces between the episodes of defecation and when we want to go to the washroom the colonic muscles contract and they propel the contents of the colon towards the anus and the rectum and the anus so this is very important to know is that when we strain when we sit in the toilet commode and when we strain what happens is that the anorectal angle that we see over here gets becomes obtuse that means widens so when we strain the anorectal angle widens the puborectalis muscle becomes loose there is a descent of the pelvic floor downwards there is a relaxation of the internal as well as the external anal sphincter and there is a contraction of the rectum and all this in synergy is important to help you evacuate your stools so when we sit see the angle is less acute that is it is it is less obtuse sorry so when we sit it takes the color the stool go across this particular angle like this so it is more obtuse i mean uh, it is more acute but when we squat that is when we sit in an indian style of toilet when the when the hips become flexed here the angle becomes more obtuse so the stools take less effort to pass from the rectum to the anal canal and hence the squatting position is very important to help pass stools efficiently and hence the indian toilets are much better as compared to the western commodes when it comes to the act of evacuation of stools hence the obtuse angle is very important this is very important when you have to tell your patients of how to sit on the toilet if they are constipated another important thing is that when we wake up in the morning when we walk and when we eat a breakfast this is the time when the colonic activity is the best so the urge to pass stool is most likely going to be in the morning when you eat something or when you drink some coffee or when you take a hot drink so that urge will be most in the morning and what you have to tell your patients is that to use this particular reflex which is the gastroileal or the gastrocolic reflex which can help the patient defecate better also small and hard stools are more difficult to pass than large or soft stools so if the stool is bulky if the stool is soft and it is large it is easier to pass that stool as compared to gole as compared to small or hard stools so very important for the stool to be soft and large for it to be evacuated easily so this is how i again depict, depict this particular angle in the particular picture is that when you go in a squatting position the op- angle becomes less acute that is more obtuse and there is a better descent of the pelvic floor as compared to when we are sitting on the western type of toilets 
So many patients will come to you uh, regarding I am constipated. So you have to really find out whether they are constipated or no. And the best way to find that is by defining constipation. So how do we define constipation? And this is the latest criteria for constipation. And constipation is defined as it must include at least two of the following six criteria present for the last three months, at least six months prior. So it should be more than two criteria which should be present for the last three months with the onset of symptoms at least six months prior. And what do I mean by these criteria? The patient should complain that he's training while passing at least one fourth of the stools. He should complain that he is having lumpy or hard stools during one fourth of the defecations at least. He should say that he has a sensation of incomplete evacuation, sensation of anorectal obstruction or blockage. He may use manual maneuvers like using a finger to evacuate stool or support of the pelvic floor at least in one fourth of the defecations and he should have less than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. Please remember that we are talking about a colonic transit time. The upper limit is 72 hours. That is three days. So thrice a week, say be less usne emotions pass ke. That means that he is constipated. So if he has any two out of these six criteria, then you must make a clinical diagnosis that look, this patient is constipated. At the same time, in constipation, rarely do you have loose stools, except when the patient is using laxatives. So if the patient is saying, I pass normal or loose stools, that that patient is not constipation, constipated. And yes, of course, the patient should have insufficient criteria for IBS. Now, IBS is something which is very closely related to constipation. And how do we define IBS? Is IBS is when you have abdominal pain. In constipation, you may not have pain. May or may not, more likely may not have pain. But in IBS, you do have pain. And when you have pain, associated with defecation or abdominal pain associated with change in the frequency of stools or abdominal pain associated with change in the form of stools, then we make a clinical diagnosis of IBS. So please understand that here we have abdominal pain and with that pain, there is motions. With that pain, there is change in frequency of stool and with that pain, there is a change in the form or appearance of stools. And when this is present, at least for more than a day in the week in the last three months with an onset of symptoms more than six months prior to the diagnosis, then we make a clinical diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. Now, very important is that we rule out certain warning signs. And when these signs are present, this patient is not IBS. And what are these signs? Age more than 50 years, recent change in bowel habit, overt GI bleeding, that is black stools or hematochesia, that is maroon colored stools, pain, during passage of stools, unintentional weight loss, family history of colorectal cancers or IBD, palpable abdominal mass or lymphadenopathy, iron deficiency anemia on blood testing, and a positive stool for fecal occult blood. Now, if these uh, warning signs are present, then the patient is less likely going to be irritable bowel and more likely going to be some other pathology of the colon. So, when we tell the patient, like, uh, what do you mean by hard or lumpy stools? Because that is the criteria to diagnose constipation. This is what we tell the patients to look at. So this is easily available in the internet. You can just take a printout of this uh, uh, through Google and post it in your OPD and ask the patient uh, as such as how does this stool look like? Now, please understand that the types of stools are, as per the Bristol classification extend from type 1 to type 7. And they depend upon how much amount of time the stool stays in the colon. So if it stays for a longer period of time, the stool becomes like this. That is separate hard lumps like nuts, which are hard to pass. If they are sausage shaped, but lumpy, they are type two. And these two make the patient is, that means if the patient is saying that it's this type of stools, the patient is constipated. Now type three and type four are normal stools. Type three is sausage shaped with cracks on its surface. Type 4 is sausage shaped like a snake, smooth and soft. And type 5, 6 and 7, where they are soft blobs, fluffy pieces or watery, that means that the patient has diarrhea. That means that the transit time is also pretty less. So moving on from uh, how what is the physiology of defecation to the uh, classific, I mean, to the, uh, I mean, the definition of constipation, we move on to the risk factors for constipation. So as we all know, as we age, as our age increases, we become more and more constipated. And why does that happen? Is because our food intake goes down, our physical activity goes down, 
our abdominal and pelvic muscles become weak and hence we cannot exert that much pressure. Most of patients with advanced stage, I'm not saying most of it, but many of them have chronic illnesses. They may have some psychological factors and they may be on certain medications that itself causes constipation. And hence, advanced stage is a risk factor for constipation. Also, being a female, you tend to be more constipated as compared to males. And that's because of high progesterone when females have, which is not present in males that make them slightly more constipated. Also, low level of education, low level of physical activity, more of desk job and sedentary lifestyle, low socioeconomic status, multiracial ethnicity, and certain medications are also risk factors for constipation. So when a patient comes to you in your OPD complaining of lumpy heart stools, difficulty to pass stools, training, manual man removal maneuvers, less than three bowel movements per week, and you know that, look, this patient put is, is fits into the definition of constipation, then you have to classify this patient into whether there is an organic cause for constipation, which is seen in 20% of cases, or this constipation is functional. And this is the most important thing that you need to do, is that because the management is very much different in both the cases. So you must ask the patient if the constipation is new onset, if there is weight loss, if there is anorexia, if there is rectal bleeding, you feel a mass in the abdomen, if there is fever, constitutional symptoms, or a family history of colonic carcinoma, then this patient is more likely going to be organic constipation than functional. Please understand, and this is what even I use to differentiate patients, is that if the patient is coming of long-standing symptoms, then this patient is more likely to be functional and not organic. So less likely to going to be cancer or something else and more likely to going to be functional as compared to a shorter onset of symptoms. So in organic causes, which is a minuscule one-fifth of the causes of constipation, the most common is cancer. That's the most common thing that we, we and, and that we also think about left colon and this is making the patient having a mechanical obstruction in passing stools. A very important cause for organic constipation is medications. And you will not believe me, there are certain medications as what we prescribe routinely that can give rise to constipation. Hence, it is very important for us to go through their medication chart. There are certain metabolic, endocrine, neurologic, and myopathic uh, diseases that cause organic constipation. And we'll deal with each of them in the next coming slides. And then the most common cause of chronic constipation is functional, where the, it can it is further subclassified into three types normal transit slow transit and defecatory disorder in normal transit constipation the patient will say i'm constipated but he'll have the urge to pass through in slow transit the patient will not have an urge to pass through so urge is very important to differentiate if the, if the, if the patient is having functional constipation and in defecatory disorder that is pelvic dysenergia because of problems in evacuating the stool in these type of particular subgroup of patients the patient will always complain that he feels like passing stools all the time, but he just cannot pass stools satisfactorily. And this is the subclassification of functional constipation, which is seen in majority of cases of chronic constipation. So let us, let us look at certain mechanical causes. Now, uh, this is what I'll be dealing first, the organic causes, which is seen in 20% of the cases, each of them separately. So first is mechanical obstruction, and the most common is anal stenosis, colorectal cancer, extrinsic compression from probably a pelvic mass or pelvic deposit from a cancer. A rectocele, sigmoidal seal, are also reasons why the patient can get constipated. And obviously, a stricture in the colon is another reason why there can be mechanical obstruction and organic cause of constipation. Now, medications. Very common medications that we prescribe in OPD routinely, like crocin, more than seven tablets a day, sorry, a week certain calcium, calcium supplements, iron supplements, painkillers, insects, certain diuretics that we prescribe to our uh, CK, uh, COs, I mean the CKD or the heart patients, that is furosemide, calcium channel blockers, verapamil, are very common drugs that give rise to constipation. Other ones that give rise to constipation are, are antacids, especially the aluminum containing one, digene, anticholinergic agents, which are used in neurological disorders like antiparkinsonian drugs, which reduce the colonic motility, antipsychotics, antispasmodics, and TCAs that we commonly use for psychiatric conditions can cause constipation. Also, certain anticonvulsant and antineoplastic drugs are known to cause constipation. And hence, it is very important to go through the patient medication list. So if he is on calcium channel blocker started recently and the patient is saying, now I've started having constipation for the last three months from when he has started taking calcium, 
uh, calcium supplements or new on, uh, calcium channel blockers or iron supplements or painkillers, that means that that could be the cause for constipation and we must stop that medication and the constipation reverses on its own. Certain metabolic and endocrinological disorders also cause constipation. Common is diabetes. Diabetes affects the nerves, makes the colonic movement slow. Heavy metal poisoning, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypothyroidism, pituitary disorders, porphyria, and pregnancy itself can cause constipation. We all know that. And there are certain neurologic and myopathic disorders because of the problem with the muscles or the problem in the nerve conduction where the signal goes to the colon to have happen to have a contraction to pass stools doesn't happen and then the patient can get constipated and there are multiple neurological disorders uh, uh, enumerated here from a to s that is amyloidosis chagas dermatomyositis parkinson's spinal cord injury stroke systemic sclerosis and all this can also cause constipation so when a patient comes to you very important you ask for medical history endocrinological problems neurological problems look at the medication list look at the Alarm signs and symptoms. Is the patient losing weight? Is the patient having bleeding PR? Is the patient has, having a new onset constipation, especially elderly patients? And this must open our eyes towards an organic cause, which can be correctable. Then from the organic, we move to the functional cause, which is seen in 80% of the cases. And as I described earlier, functional constipation is subdivided into three types, three subdivisions, normal transit constipation, slow transit constipation and defecatory disorder. Now in normal transit constipation, the patient says that he has an incomplete evacuation. He may have abdominal pain, but that is not the prominent symptom. Abdominal pain more with IBS, less likely going to be functional constipation. But the patient says that he has an urge to pass stool. And this is how that urge will help you to differentiate between normal and slow transit constipation. In slow transit constipation, that means that the colonic muscles just don't move the patient will have very much infrequent stools. If somebody says that, then this could be slow transit constipation and this has got an effective treatment now. Also, there is a lack, to, lack of urge to defecate. So the patient says that I don't feel motion. And this also tells that probably this patient has slow transit constipation. There is, in this particular subgroup, there is a poor response to fiber and laxatives. And you would give the patient lactifiber, isaf goal, and the patient just doesn't open his bowel. And then again, that just points that look, probably this could be slow transit constipation. These patients have more generalized symptoms. They are more malaise. They may have more fatigue. And this is very commonly seen in younger women who come to your OPD with constipation. What test we do over here is we do the colonic transit study, which I'll come to the in the later slide. And then there is defecatory disorder. Now here, what the patient will say is that he is unable to pass stool, but he always feels the urge to pass stool. He feels that Motions clean or clean in Eva, only dalte motion nikal nikale, obstructed feel karte, heavy perineum feel karte, heavy, heavy lakta hai niche, sandas ke jagepe heavy lakta hai. And this is where you must think that, oh, probably this patient may have a defecatory disorder. And how do we diagnose it is by using a balloon expulsion test or an inolectal manometry. And I'll come to that in the next few slides. So when a patient comes to us in the OPD, history is very important. Ask them, show them the Bristol stool chart. Ask them, how is, does the stool look? How, what is the size of the stool? Is there any straining? Ask them for warning symptoms. Is there weight loss? Is there bleeding per rectum? Have you noticed that the stool initially was thick, but now has become thin, that is change in caliber of stool? Is there severe abdominal pain? I'm not saying mild abdominal pain with stool. Mild pain with passage of stool is more likely IBS. But severe abdominal pain with or without passage of stool is more likely going to be an organic cause for constipation. Or is there a family history of colon cancers? And if these warning signs and symptoms are present, straight up the patient goes for a colonoscopy or a CT scan. Look at the duration of symptoms. Longer the duration of symptoms, more likely going to be a functional constipation. Lesser the earlier the onset, that is new onset of symptoms, more likely going to be a structural disease that is a cancer or a tumor. Look at the dietary history. Is the patient taking sufficient fiber? Is the patient taking enough fluid? Ask them, does the patient have a breakfast? Breakfast is very important. It exacerbates constipation if we skip breakfast. Breakfast increases the colonic motility. So the best colonic motility is seen in the morning. If you have breakfast in the morning, you have to open your bowels if you have a normal colon. Especially if you have breakfast with coffee, that's the best combination you can have. 
is that that is that really stimulates the colonic motility and is more better than a lunch or a dinner to help you evacuate. Ask the patient for medical, obstetric, or surgical histories. Look at the neurological disorders. Review their drugs. If they're taking any calcium supplements, iron supplements, any other drugs that I've I've jotted down previously, any OTC laxatives, any herbal medications, and look at any sexual abuse, any depression, because that can be associated with IBS. And this could just be, if we treat that, then the patient is relieved of the constipation. So again, in a picture form, blood in stools, severe abdominal pain, increase in the size ascites or any abdominal lump fell. This must open your eyes towards, probably this patient is having an organic cause or a tumor lying inside and hence this patient has to straight up go for endoscopy or CT scan and we should not waste time. Examine the patient. History taking is done, then examine the patient. Look at the anus. If the anus is pulled forward, usually during attempts of defecation, the anus usually descends less than one centimeter to or more than four centimeters during attempts to stimulate straining and the perineum balloons down during straining. So very important to see this pulling effect on the anus, the descent of the pelvis, and the ballooning of the perineum. And that means that that is a normal finding when we look at inspection. Do a PR examination. Look at the anal sphincter tone and look at the anal sphincter pressure when the patient is voluntarily squeezing. And then, so put, do a PR and tell the patient to squeeze. And that look at that anal pressure, sphincter pressure. If that is too high, that means there is some problem. Ideally, the anal sphincter pressure during voluntary squeeze is only minimally higher than the anal pressure press. If it is very high, that means that there is some problem. That means that probably this patient is having a pelvic floor dysenergia. Look at how much the finger is descending down. It has to descend down during examination when the patient is training for defecation. When we do a PR, look at the puborectalis muscle. If is it tender? Is any part of the anal canal tender in palpation? Is there any prolapse of the mucosa down while they are passing stools? Or is there any defect in the wall of the rectum, which is suggestive of rectocele, which could be contributing to the constipation of the patient? So in a pelvic floor dysenergia, there is impaired inner sphincter relaxation and paradoxical contraction, and there is reduced perineal descent. So once you examine the patient, so the patient comes to make a diagnosis of constipation. Then you classify organic or functional. Then you look, examine the patient, ask history, examine the patient, look at the drug chart, look at neurology, look at uh, uh, endocrinological problems. Or if that is not present, then you make a diagnosis of functional constipation. Then you evaluate the patient and routinely test that we send when we look at patients with constipation is a stool test to look at occult blood and that has to be done for three consecutive days. When we are doing that stool test, ensure that the patient doesn't remove the stool with the finger, ensure that the patient is not on any uh, iron supplements or not taking any beetroot or something like that, which can make it false positive also, and ensure that the patient is not menstruating or having bites. So stool routine is very important as a first line investigation for constipation. Look at the calcium levels for hypercalcemia. Look at the thyroid levels for hypothyroidism. Look at HbA1c. This patient could be just diabetic and the patient has never investigated. Look at the creatinine CKD patient. Look at the potassium. Hypokalemia causes ileus and causes constipation. So these are the basic investigations that you need to send. Blood investigations when you're investigating a case of constipation. Then for us, when we have this baseline investigations, we either send the patient for a colonoscopy, do a CT scan of the patient, or do the colonic transit studies uh, where we look at the physiology of defecation using MR defecography, enorectal manometry, or a rectal balloon expulsion test. And mind you, these tests are not easily available everywhere. So only at a particular centers, you'll get uh, these wireless motility capsules, transit studies, as well as MR defecography, as well as a manometry. So it is not easily available for us, even for us, for that matter. So once we make a diagnosis, once we do the investigations, we have to put the patient to the respective category. So if any patient is having an alarming symptom, rapid worsening of symptom, new onset symptom, obstructive features, think about mitotic disease. Send the patients directly to colonoscopy or CT entrography. If the patient is saying long-standing symptoms, chronic constipation, the patient says motion chai hoti, think about slow transit constipation, send the patient for a colonic transit study, colonic motility capsule or a manometry. If the patient is saying that motion hai, 
फुल लगता है इवेक्युएटी नहीं होता है then this patient could have pelvic floor dysmenorrhea these patients always have an urge to pass stools as i've said previously and very important to do an anorectal manometry mr echocardiography and a balloon expulsion test in these patients that helps us to diagnose pelvic floor dysmenorrhea now in balloon expulsion test a 50 ml balloon is placed in the rectum and the patient is given a minute to evacuate and if he evacuates within a minute that is normal and in ibs patients where there is pain associated with stools otherwise there is no pain then you have no specific investigation so this is the coloring motility capsule where they look at the ph and the movement so more for us and this is the coloric transit study where the patient eats a pellet which is present in the capsule so these are the pellets when we do the x ray they are radio opaque and at the end of 5 days if 20% of the pellets are still present in the intestine that means that the patient is having slow transit constipation and that helps us to make a diagnosis of slow transit constipation can you look at these pellets which are radio opaque material seen in the colon so again a practical approach here so if a patient is constipated you must do a thorough physical examination take the history and treat secondary causes of constipation so look at the drug charts if they have any offending drugs stop the drugs look at their dietary history ensure that they are taking enough fiber and enough water only fiber is not uh, enough the fiber has to be associated with enough intake of water if there is an inadequate response treat them and how do you treat them i'll tell you in the next few slides and if there is an incomplete response to even adequate treatment then subject the patient to further tests like anorectal manometry balloon expulsion test if that is inconclusive then an mr defecography and if that is normal then a colonic transit study so uh, we would do all this beyond this but i'm sure that you all can help us till this particular level where you send us patients if at all if they are not uh, responding to regular treatment which helps us to further evaluate what is happening with them general considerations very important for telling patients what do you do for constipation routinely most of the patients require just reassurance they are stressed out they are constipated it is acute new onset constipation young patient coming to you chart then say motion in ui reassure them nothing is wrong they require more of psychosocial support tell them to increase their physical activity tell them to do some light exercise look at their drugs if are they taking any new newly they are taking any constipating drugs tell them to use this stool 6 inch stool below their legs below their feet when they are sitting on the toilet try and have the indian position for passing stools where the hips are flexed towards the squatting position when they are passing stools tell them to hold their breath while pushing down ensure that they have enough water intake up to 1.5 to 2 liters of water because that enhances the effect of fiber and use the gastrocolic reflex in the morning breakfast with coffee use that and tell the patient have breakfast drink tea or coffee and go and sit in the toilet for 5 minutes and use this particular gastrocolic reflex even if there is no urge and this is the basic that we need to do for patients with constipation from the basic treatment basic advice you go to medications so generally this is how we follow and even i think y'all should also follow this particular way of treating these patients so first add fiber and osmotic laxatives osmotic laxatives are milk of magnesia and polyethylene glycol first is this if they are not responding to this add lubiprostone procalopride or linaclot and if they are not responding to this too then give intermittent bisacodyl or sedap and this is how you will have a general approach we all follow this and it gives good results and even if you can inculcate this in your practice it will be beneficial you must know that there are so many home remedies for constipation flax seeds green leafy vegetables aloe vera lemon grass cabbage citric and the list goes on and on and uh, you can take a snapshot of this particular picture uh, to help uh, tell the patients of what to eat as home remedies for constipation which are high in fiber if the patient is having fat diets please tell them to stop it no burgers no pizzas no canned foods no sausages and no chips so no mcdonald sorry and that could be one reason why the patient is constipated fiber very important in the diet there should be at least 25 to 30 grams of soluble fiber now the word soluble is very important so that means oat bran nuts barley beans lentils peas fruits vegetables isaf gol that is psyllium all this hold water make the stool bulky and soluble fiber is very important as as a part of fiber supplementation please don't give them insoluble fiber 
wheat bran wheat choki gehu choki very i mean that just doesn't help it is very much less tolerated it is coarse particles are large whole grains again particles are large they can cause mechanical irritation and mucus secretion and may not help as much as soluble fibers do so by eating whole wheat bread unrefined cereals plenty of fruits and vegetables you can ensure a 25 gram intake of non starch polysaccharides which are soluble the problem with fiber is that if patients say they are bloated so if a patient comes to constipation and you have to decide what to give fiber or polyethylene glycol and then ask the patient phula phula lagta hai gassy gassy lagta hai ha bahut zyada lagta hai to avoid fiber because the side effects of fiber is abdominal distension bloating flatulence it can it has poor taste and can lead to poor patient adherence though we have more of flavored fiber coming in now is a uh, flavored isavgol that is fibogen in orange flavor coming in so that really helps with the taste but again if the patient is saying bahut zyada pet phoolta hai try and avoid fiber as much as possible and fiber is a strict no in pelvic floor dysmenorrhea where the patient has a continuous urge to pass stool as i described previously and fiber can do more worse than benefit in these particular group of patients so fibers that are commonly available outside the most common is psyllium isafcol it is ground seed husk of isafgula plant when it come gets combined with water it forms a gel and hence increased intake of water is very important isafgol with two glasses of water is very important isafgol undergoes bacterial degradation and can give rise to bloat and fat platelets so this is the problem with isafgol and hence many patients discontinue isafgol because of this particular problem moving on from fiber to osmotic laxatives so as i said the first thing to give is fiber or osmotic laxative or a combination bloat ho raha hai to fiber mat do osmotic laxative do in osmotic laxatives we have got magnesium milk of magnesia the most commonly used thing we give for patients is milk of magnesia look at the dose 50 to 30 ml once or twice very important to give the adequate dose for these patients problem is hypermagnesemia so milk of magnesia excessive can cause hypermagnesemia avoid in children and patients with kidney failure second is lactulose that we commonly use very commonly seen lacti have dufelac uh, uh and so many other brands that are present which are poorly absorbable sugars and the dose again here is 15 to 30 ml once or twice a day problem with lactulose is again gas and bloating and then we have other poorly absorbed sugars like sorbitol and mannitol which we don't commonly use sorbitol is the artificial sweetener sugar free and mannitol which we know routinely use for constipation uh the other best drug in poorly absorbed sugar is polyethylene glycol so if if the patient says ki mujhe fiber is sab ko se phula phula lagta hai give them polyethylene glycol and that is as effective as fiber polyethylene glycol the dose is 70 to 34 grams once or twice a day so two scoops in a glass of water is sufficient polyethylene glycol is not digestive bacteria so causes less bloating less cramps it is tasteless and odorless and this is what we use as gastroenterologists and hepatologists for our colonic bowel preparations before an endoscopy so you must have heard about peglec so peglec is a lot of polyethylene glycol so if the amount of polyethylene glycol goes up the more loose the stool becomes uh, when you consume polyethylene glycol typically when you use osmotic laxatives you may you will have a bowel movement within 6 hours and that is very important so os osmotic laxatives are a first line therapy for patients who are constipated a quick two words about lactulose and polyethylene polyethylene glycol because you'll be using them quite frequently lactulose is non absorbable synthetic disaccharide it is galactose and fructose linked by a bond resistant to lactase it is not absorbed by the small intestine when lactulose reaches the colon it gets fermented by the bacteria and it gives rise to short chain fatty acids and hydrogen and this is that hydrogen which reduces the fecal ph so you must have heard patients with hepatic encephalopathy are given lactulose why does that happen is because of this hydrogen formation low ph bacteria don't proliferate in ph less ammonia formation less encephalopathy and hence we give lactulose or dufelac commonly in patients with hepatic encephalopathy to reduce the colonic bacterial load time of onset of lactulose is usually 2 to 3 days so if if the patient is mildly constipated use lactulose and tell them it will take 2 days for them to open your bowels osmotic laxatives takes 6 hours lactulose specifically takes 2 to 3 days so the time of onset is slightly longer lactulose may loses effect over a period of time because it alters the intestinal flora 
एंड हेंस लैक्टिलोज इनिशियली पेशेंट्स काफी टाइम बोलते हैं कि पहले तो डिफ्लेक्स साफ होता है अभी नहीं होता एंड दैट व्हाई डू पेशेंट्स से दैट इज बिकॉज द इंटेस्टिनल फ्लोरा गेट्स ऑल्टर्ड बिकॉज ऑफ द फॉल इन द फीकल पीएच द प्रॉब्लम विद लैक्टिलोज लाइक इस साफ कोल इज गैस एंड ग्लो polyethylene glycol the best i i say at present is isoosmotic laxative it is metabolically inert and it binds to water molecules bacteria have no effect on polyethylene glycol and hence it causes less bloat and less gas there is increase in stool volume it makes the stool softer and if you take more of polyethylene glycol as I, as i said for a colonic preparations the stool becomes more and more liquidish uh, depending upon the volume of the polyethylene glycol consumed moving on from osmotic to stimulant laxatives and this is what we routinely use for a, if a patient comes to teen din se pesh saaf mein otherwise to koi problem nahi hai this is what you need to use is stimulant laxatives but very important is we should not use stimulant laxatives for a long period of time is because they are not good so stimulant laxatives increase the intestinal motility it helps in the water and electrolyte secretion into the lumen of the colon helps in prostaglandin secretion and hence accelerates the colonic transit time action is fast you give bisacodyl that is you give the suppository uh, or you give orally dalcolax and within few hours the patient opens the bowels problem is abdominal cramps it is very good for a single dose use for temporary constipation so let us look at some stimulant laxatives the most common that we use are ayurvedic preparations sena kasakara castor oil that we commonly use uh for for passing stools problem with sena and uh, uh, ayurvedic preparations are that they can cause something called as pseudo melanosis coli where the colon becomes discolored but that's not that's not a problem though it doesn't cause problems with the colonic wall but it can discolor the colon and the most commonly what we use is bisacodyl where the, we give dalcolax orally and that helps us to evacuate the stools uh sodium picosulfate is something which is used very commonly in the uk it is and it is available with the brand name of piclin and this is also very good stimulant laxative if the patient is complaining of uh, acute onset constipation and there are no red flags we may try sodium picosulfate also there are certain enemas that that help in relieving constipation especially acute onset constipations without red flags and let us look at the enemas we have different types proctoclysis soap glycerin and water how do they work they go inside cause distension of the rectum they soften the hard stools very important for us to know that when you put the enema inside it should when it goes beyond the anal canal it should be directed posteriorly because a nozzle can cause a lot of rectal damage it can cause the anti rectal mucosa because that becomes most vulnerable to trauma with the tip of that enema bottle that you are using especially when we are putting it through the backward angulated anal canal so once the enema nozzle goes inside the anal canal go slightly posteriorly such that it doesn't hurt the anal or rectal wall regular use of bisacodyl suppositories unwise if a patient says ki mai roz dalcolex leta hu dalcoflex leta hu just tell them not to do it is that because it alters the rectal surface epithelium and the crypts and it is not good in long term use now there are certain new agents available we all know it we all have used it and the most common of them which are at present available in india is lubiprostol linaclotide is going to come soon and procalopride so lubovel and pruvis or pruvic which many of us would be prescribing at present and the dose for pruvis or pruvic is 2 mg daily dose for lubiprostol that is lubovel is 8 to 24 microgram twice a day so first let us look at lubiprostol what lubiprostol does is that it activates the intestinal chloride channels at the level of the intestinal epithelial cells so it increases the chloride secretion into the lumen and this chloride brings in sodium brings in water and increases the stool pulp so there is a lot of intestinal fluid secretion and acceleration of transit and it doesn't alter the serum electrolyte levels so even though it's a chloride channel activator it doesn't affect the chloride level in the body the dose is 8 to 24 microgram twice a day and with lubiprostol news patients say that they have less straining they have more better stool consistency and overall reduced severity of symptoms the best part about lubiprostol is if we stop lubiprostol the patients say that there is no rebound effect after withdrawal if we stop lactulose uh, patient eventually may become resistant to lactulose that is dufelac but with lubiprostol the patients again start responding if we stop and again restart 
the most common adverse luck reaction with lubiprosin is nausea and this is what makes the patient not take the molecule 30 percent is too high to have uh, to to have an adverse drug reaction and this is the most common complaint that patients say with lubiprostom so the us fda has recommended the use of lubiprostom in opioid induced constipation as well as for all women with ibsc at the dose of 8 microgram twice a day please avoid lubiprostom in patients with pregnancy or mechanical obstruction so stimulant laxatives as well as lubiprostom and fucalopril should not be used when the patient is having a mechanical obstruction that is the patient is having a tumor second drug is linaclotide going to come soon to the indian markets uh, it activates the cgmp receptor on the luminal surface of the intestinal epithelium causing increased levels of cgmp and hence increased secretion of chloride and bicarbonate into the lumen, intestinal lumen chloride and bicarbonate pull water along with it and increase the bulk so secrete the agents into the colon problem with the linaclotide is diarrhea the, again the problem is that linaclotide cannot be used in pediatric patients and the dose is you start with a higher dose 145 microgram once daily and then come down when symptoms are better to 72 micrograms daily so linaclotide is the new molecule which is going to come soon to the indian markets which is going to give you another option than lubiprostan and trucalopride Brucalopride is 5-HT4 agonist. Now, what 5-HT4 does is that it stimulates the motility of the colon. So, when patients are having slow transit constipation, motion ki ichhai nahi hoti, hafte mein ek bar motion pass hota hai, use brucalopride in them because in this particular drug will accelerate the colonic transit. But the most problem uh, problem with the uh, brucalopride is that it can cause headaches, nausea, and diarrhea. But believe me, I've used it in many patients and most of them do not complain of headache, nausea, and diarrhea. Very important point I would like to say here is don't give brucalopride in the dose of 2 milligrams to elderly. If it is more than 60 years of age, 1 milligram. That's the dose. And the patient uh, and with brucalopride, there is no cardiac aid adverse drug reactions because they are, these are 5 HT4. It was thought that probably there would be cardiac adverse drug reactions, but none of them with brucalopride at present. So what choice of drug will you make at the end of the day? The patient comes to you, what will you give the patient, right? So the number needed to treat, that means that if I give three patients osmotica stimulant laxatives, it will work. So it will not, it may not work in two patients, but it will work in one of the three particular patients. The number need, needed to treat, lesser the number, more effective the drug is. So the best drug here is polyethylene glycol, only 2.4. So the first choice, as I said, fiber, fiber ke baad hai, polyethylene glycol or osmotic stimulant laxative. Choice number two, polyethylene glycol or osmotic stimulant laxative and fiber other than lifestyle modifications and then go on to lubiprostan, linaclotide which is going to come soon and brucalopride. So one, first add this, not better, then go for this, so for these patients. You must know very important what brands have bought it and we, we just write drugs but we don't know what, what they contain. So uh, brand names, Dufilac, Lactihep, Loose, Gut Clear have only lactulose. Brand name Dufilac Bulk has lactulose and fiber, bulk fiber. Brand name Lactihep Plus has, along with lactulose, has got liquid paraffin, milk of magnesia, and sodium picosulfate. Brand name Cremafin has liquid paraffin and milk of magnesia. Brand name Cremafin Plus, along with this two, also has sodium picosulfate, which is stimulant laxative. Brand name Pegred has polyethylene glycol, Movicol and Pegalup all have got polyethylene glycol and some other electrolytes and piclin is sodium picosulfate. So for polyethylene glycol, pegrate, movicol and pegalup is there. And along with that, you may either give this or this. And if the patient doesn't respond to this or this or a combination of this, then you go on to brucalopride or linaclotide or lubovel that is dubiprostol. So the choice of drugs. Functional normal transit constipation. So we are not talking about organic constipation. Organic constipation treatment is, you know, colonoscopy, find out what is the cause for the organic problem and treat it accordingly. Find the drugs, re remove that drug from the patient's medication list. But if it is a functional constipation, normal transit, give them fiber, polyethylene glycol, liquid paraffin, don't respond, add to color. Right? If it's a slow transit constipation, Increase their water intake, fiber and all. If they don't respond, prucalopride. It increases the colonic motility. Functional constipation, slow transit constipation, prucalopride, drug of choice. And in pelvic flow dysenergia, avoid fiber. As I told you previously, give them polyethylene glycol, help them to do biofeedback exercises, diaphragmatic exercises and relaxation techniques. And that might really help these patients with pelvic flow dysenergia. More newer and newer drugs are coming in. 
we have allobixi bat we have got other 5st4 agonists propellopride ke bade bhai naronapride velucet velucet tract we have got sodium hydrogen exchange inhibitor tenapanor which is going to come soon to the indian markets and obviously the cgmp gmp agonists other than lenaclotide plecanatide which is again going to come to the indian market soon so with this i would like to thank everybody for the patient listening and i hope uh, this has been informative to you this has helped you to make an informed choice of how to identify these patients with risk factors without risk factors what are the choice of drugs that you use for these patients and that would really help you to have a better more easier practice and good patient satisfaction thank you so much for your patient listening if you have any issues you can always feel please feel free to call me and i'll be very happy to help you out thank you once again and thank you um we have seen dr uh, amay sir ki uh, you have uh, such a eminent speaker that you have been covered almost all uh, the basic uh, questions actually there is no more than the chat box there is some questions uh, there are some i will duck like castrol and all that to be used or not but i think you have um, uh, soul softener laxatives or the fibers or the uh, drinking waters almost you have covered each and everything about the treatment basis the second thing those were should we encourage the patients uh, to have the things because they are having the habits of coffee tea or sometime morning a newspaper reading to, uh, before going to the news uh, before going to pass the stool uh, they have some habits of mushery or tobacco also or some yeah. cigarette smoking also so we could so that is stimulation stimulation yeah. of the gut <laughs> but i'll tell you the best way is good nashta go for yeah. a walk have coffee Best yeah, way to open the bowel. Correct, correct, correct. And even we have seen that most of patients having the gastrocolic reflexes. Actually, they likely to pass the stool after the food or after the breakfast. Yes. Should we entertain them then? <laughs> Absolutely, happy especially with. with the constipated. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, tell them that even if you don't feel the urge, do just go to the washroom and sit, and you might just pass your stool. You know, uh, especially when they're constipated. Okay. Uh, Doctor Jumani, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Sir. So most of the time, the patients, as you mentioned, they because of a Mumbai lifestyle, early morning they don't have having breakfast there, but they have a history of late defecations. It is not in the morning, but afternoon. Will that be the definition of a constipation? No, oh, no, no. Late defecation doesn't fit into the criteria of constipation. Constipation means you have hard, lumpy stools, urge to pass stools, manual maneuver, evacuation maneuvers. We have lumpy stools, and we have discussed that. But late defecation, if there's a stool is normal, that doesn't fit into constipation. So for these patients, as I told you, first only reassure them. Nee, kuch nee, normal hai. Don't worry at all, and that will just help them calm the nerves down. So what is the difference between lactic lol and lactulose? Lactitol and lactulose. It's almost similar. It's different molecules. <laughs> Nothing much difference here. So someone is someone is asking about the overuse of the laxatives. <laughs> Use. So, uh, <laughs> laxative abuse is definitely not good. So, what we have to do is tell these patients to do more of lifestyle modifications. Eventually, increase their physical activity, do lifestyle modifications. But in some patients, like uh, for example, slow transit constipation, you just cannot do anything about it. You have to give them uh, uh, something like a procalopride for lifelong. Or, I mean, you can just give it for six months, twelve months, eighteen months, twenty-four months till 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 it becomes safer. And we have seen with these laxatives, it doesn't really cause much serious side effects. But yes. The stimulant laxatives should not be used. So, if somebody is using Sena, somebody is using Ayurvedic concoction, somebody is using Pisacodil, Dalcolax, that is bad because that can further affect the colon. It can cause cryptitis, crypt loss, and colonic problems, and that should be avoided. So, the idea is to give them adequate dosage, dosage and duration, and just over a period of time wean them off with good lifestyle modifications. So you mentioned procalopride cardiac side effect. What are the cardiac? It doesn't side? have, sir. It doesn't have cardiac side effects. No, no side effect. It doesn't have. Yeah. One milligram in elderly people doesn't work, sir. <laughs> I know, but two milligrams is not recommended in elderly. So you may add something else, sir. You may add some uh, osmotic laxative with that procalopride. Okay. So most of the time, Ayurvedic preparation work better than the allopathy. What? The Because reason? they're stimulant, na? They're stimulant. They cause stimulation of the colonic movement. So in long term, it is not good to use stimulant like that. Yes, as I told you, short term it is quite good. If somebody comes to your OPD saying that, look, I've got constipation for the last four days. Otherwise, I'm fine. I don't know something has happened here. You may give them some something like Sena, Castor Oil, or you may give them a uh, Besa Codil, Dalcolax, and they immediately open and you'll be they'll be fine. 
but long term user stimulant is not good the so functional you mentioned peg as number 1 2.4 yes, yes. but every day we cannot give that sir you can give peg it is the in fact in if you see the us guidelines for constipation polyclinical is the first drug that they give and in other drugs follow that in 1 liter of water everything no 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 i am this not peglex sir that is not colonic preparation it comes as a powder also okay one scoop ha cola peglex nahi roz dena hai pegred ya the movie call sachet that i told you na in in the last slide there are certain brands available for polyclinical like well peglex yeah, pegalo pegalo 25 ml and what you give that you don't give peglex preparation peglex is only for us for colonoscopy sir <laughs> thank you sir thank you and which drugs which drugs are more uh, safest in the infants or the small uh, children so movie call uh, polyclinical is safest uh, polyclinical comes as pediatric movie call pediatric it is very good for infants you can use that milk of magnesia you can use in infants but don't give excessive because it can cause hypermagnesemia in children so short term you can give no problem one more is about the facial impact with the cause of the management of the facial impact which impaction of ha huh. fecal impact impaction fecal. ha huh. so uh, very commonly if you if you take proper history in some patients who are fecally impacted what they say is that pehle to motion pass hi nahi hota पर अभी थोड़ा थोड़ा पतला पतला आ रहा है एंड व्हाट हैपेंस इन दिस पर्टिकुलर पेशेंट्स इज दैट दिस स्टूल हार्ट स्टूल गेट्स स्टक एंड ओवर द ऑल लो स्टूल इज देयर सो इट ट्रिकल्स फ्रॉम द साइड ऑफ द हार्ट स्टूल डाउन एंड यू कैन देल देल से दैट अभी थोड़ा थोड़ा म्यूकस स्टेप पतला पतला आता है पर अच्छा सामने होता है सो फीकल इंपैक्शन द ओनली वे यू कैन डू इट इज यूज एन एनीमा व्हेन इट सॉफ्टेंस दैट फीकल इंपैक्शन व्हाट वी आल्सो डू इज अ कोलोनोस्कोपिक वी पुट अ कोलोनोस्कोप एंड पुट सम एनीमा अबाउट दैट and sometimes the surgeons obviously do manual evacuation under even general anesthesia at times you know that so it may even require a patient to go to the ot to remove the stools we have seen the most of the in motor neuron diseases actually in the patients is the bed ridden having the chronic constipations what the drug of the choice should be there so here again as i told you the first drug to use is an osmotic laxative and then you add procalopride or linaclotide or lubiprostol so follow this only everywhere first fiber lifestyle modification then comes fiber osmotic laxative then comes procalopride so add on like that and help them because i have seen one uh, muscular atrophy patients uh, young 15 years guy but actually he is very much suppressed with the uh, this passing the stool and all that right. uh, really the father and he is so much worried about the things actually so you can give some fibers or some osmotic laxative milk of magnesia and along with that if that doesn't help then uh, polyethylene glycol and that doesn't help then procalopride you can add procalopride or linaclotide or lubiprostol and sos basis pe dalcolex sos basis yeah this recording will be get to you personally or we will send it to the uh, group uh, kindly note that and sir is in the hurry because he is having the second another yes, lectures <laughs> by the 6 o'clock so we will try to end the session But and i think this we can, have, more, we can <laughs> have more i've got common common topics like uh, bloat gas dyspepsia gerd very common yeah. topics that everybody sees in opd yeah yeah second is approach to lft liver fun- abnormal liver function test approach just the approach or what yes, do you sir, do yes. to see how will you evaluate yes sir. third is uh, cirrhosis overview that also we can have nafid non alcoholic fatty basics and beyond so that is also ready <laughs> okay okay thank you okay, sir. sir thank you sir thank you thank excellent you very much lecture. excellent lecture thank sir you. thank you so much sir a probiotic also helps uh, yeah. uh, for in certain patients it may help but uh, not recommended as a treatment for constipation probiotic more for diarrhea okay thank you thank you so much sir thank, thank you, you sir. thank you have a nice day good evening then thank you, manual, thank you manual manual to the all, all of the participants thank you very much we'll end the session manual manual evacuation evacuation okay no arun would you